this pre-meeting briefing and address and from franchise the Board of Trustees to order at 6 p.m. on March 5th, 2020. The purpose of this pre-meeting briefing is to conduct a briefing session with administrative staff regarding the posted agenda for our regular board meeting scheduled for 7 p.m. on March 5th, 2020. For the record, the board members present are Tara Herbacek, John Matthews, Sally Derrick, Nancy Klein, Randy Shackman, and Guillermo Ramos. Mrs. Kelly, do we have any public comments for this time? No. So we are now moving to item number three, briefing session with administrative staff regarding the posted agenda for the regular board meeting. Are there any questions regarding consent agenda items? Mr. Shackman. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the board's preference uh, agenda item Q it's great I'm confident that we're all in favor of it it's the security vestibules and the upgrades at the three high schools one in reading through it talks about the expenditure for three high schools and it doesn't actually state which high schools and uh, my thought process is would we like to pull it and then in the comments we can identify those three and then perhaps in the minutes adjust the uh, proposal that we're approving to include the three high schools just for our transparency and so that the parents and all those people involved we are working real hard to do those security things and I kept looking and going you know what there's it would be helpful I think to actually say which three high schools I can go yeah either. I had the same question okay then I will pull that one and we will get the three high schools inserted. Yes, Mr. Budget. On um, item number um, F, on the co I'd like to um, pull that one to consider range for separate members. Yes, Mr. Anything else, board members? Mr. Ramos? Same with Smith and Vivian Field, please. Anything else? I may pull 4B, I'm thinking about things. Okay, um, Dr. Chapman, are there any reports by administration? No, there's not any reports today, but <clears throat> I wanna walk through, there's, there's several uh, events that the board will be involved in, and, and I've mentioned several of these uh, in previous meetings, but on April 2nd, you know, the Board of Trustees will hear from CV 2030, They'll make a 30-minute presentation um, about the work that they've done each month over the course of the last six months based on the board's mission, vision, guiding objectives that you set back in last September. Then on uh, April 7th, the Board of Trustees will uh, work with um, Rhonda Mintzberg, or Kathy Mintzberg, to walk through um, CRSS and those pieces that you had um, discussed. So we were able to get that on the calendar. Thank you very much. Uh, back up one month on uh, March 16th, so that's next week, excuse me, the 19th, March 19th, um, we will sit down and, and have a work study with commit to walk through some ideas with the Board of Trustees. Then on the 16th is, is going to be a big one. That's another board work study, April 16th, to where the board will hear the early literacy plan, the math plan, the CCMR plan, and then you will have the opportunity to develop the board House Bill 3 goals through the assistance of uh, Dr. Asbury as she's worked with us over the course of uh, nearly nine months on the whole process of CB 2030 to blend all those into one. After you do that and go through that process on May 7th, then the board will be able to approve those, all those plans is one along with your board goals. So there's a lot of things happening, um, a lot of meetings that we're gonna be having over the course of the next two months, but I greatly appreciate you taking the time to, to be able to meet March 19th and again um, 
on April 7th as we can knock all of these items out in the very near future. That's all I have. So, board members, it looks like we are on item number five and we've reached the end of our agenda for this pre-meeting briefing and we are adjourned at 6.06 .06 p.m. I call this regular meeting of the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD Board of Trustees to order at 7 p.m. on March 5th, 2000, well, 2020. Board members, district staff members, and members of the audience, you are free to join me in standing as Mayor Robert Dye of the City of Farmers Branch provides a message followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Sally Derrick and the Pledge to the Texas Flag led by Tara Herbacek. Good evening. It's an honor to be here and Madam President, fellow yeah. trustees. I always love saying that. Uh, <laughs> we all please bow your heads. Lord, thank you for each person, each mind, and each heart that fills the presence of this room tonight. May we ask for your blessing this evening as we gather to show our appreciation for the teachers and administrators who work tirelessly to instruct our children, both in the classroom and in life. We pray that you would help our leaders to govern wisely, help them as leaders to not ask first, how do we fix this? But what do we need to learn? How might we need to change? And to whom do we need to listen? Grant them and us the wisdom and courage to know and do what is right and good and true. May they and we speak out when it is time to speak out and listen patiently and receptively when it is time to listen. May they and we always be guided by the spirit of community, by the spirit of good governance, and by the spirit of love. Bless this meeting today, all those present, as well as the lives of those we will encounter afterward. Ready us to make every moment count. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to be Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. As a district, we dedicate all our efforts and resources to our goal of high achievement for each student. The board uses this goal to guide all deliberations, decisions, and actions. You will get to see all deliberations, decisions, and actions of the board in open session, with the exception of some items which may be discussed in a closed session as stipulated in the Texas Government Code, Section 551, commonly known as the Open Meetings Law. These items typically deal with personnel matters, consultation with our attorney, and real estate. For the record, the board members present are Tara Herbacek, John Matthews, Sally Derrick, Nancy Klein, Randy Shackman, and Guillermo Ramos. We constitute a quorum and may conduct business on behalf of the district. So, oh, ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next agenda item, I'm going to insert some humor here. I'd like to remind everybody that next week is spring break. So hopefully nobody forgets and shows up Monday. So uh, just, just making sure. But um, also, ladies and gentlemen, before moving on to the next agenda item, we'll remind you that the board encourages comments from citizens of the district and from district employees. Anyone wishing to speak, either as an individual or as a representative, may do so during agenda item number three, audience for guests. Please submit your request to do so on one of the forms provided on the table just outside the north entrance to the boardroom. You may place the completed form in the box provided on that same table or present your completed form to Administrative Assistant Ms. Trudy Kelly over here, waving her hand. When the board addresses agenda item number three, audience for guests, you will be invited to the podium to speak to the board. So item number two, special presentations and recognitions. Dr. Chapman? Yeah, at this time we'll have Don Fernell. She'll start with student recognitions. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, President Klein, and trustees. We are very excited tonight to honor one of our students. We would like to congratulate Kellen Lewis, who is a first grader at Kent Elementary School. Kellen, if you'll please come forward. <laughs> Kellen won first place and grand prize in engineering at the Regional Science Fair last month in the first and thir through third grade category. So we are very proud of him. Congratulations, Kellen. <laughs> And
And he, ha he has some support here, too, if they want to stand up or come forward for the picture, that'd be great. <laughs> Next, we'd like to introduce our teachers of the nine weeks. First, we have from uh, Pope Middle School. The principal is Kelly O'Sullivan, and the teacher is Amanda Peeler. Does she want to come forward? Yes. And um, Ms. Peeler is an eighth grade science teacher, and she has taught 16 years in the district. And this was said about her. She models servant leadership as a teacher for AVID site team member, science instructional facilitator, and a positive ambassador. She leads the way in creating a comfortable learning environment with flexible seating, coaching teachers in areas ranging from curriculum to relationships. We are proud to have her as part of our staff. Congratulations. <laughs> The next campus is Blair Elementary School. And the AP that is here tonight, the assistant principal is Lisa Tavitas. She's standing in for Mr. Ramos, who is, not, is ill tonight. And uh, the, the teacher is Kryn Villacris, and she is a kindergarten math science teacher with the district 18 years, and this was said about her. Kryn exemplifies what we would all want for our own children in the classroom. To watch her is akin to watching an artist paint a masterpiece. Like an artist, she has controlled relentless in her craft to ensure that all students achieve success at the highest levels. Congratulations. <laughs> Blanton Elementary School. The principal is Dr. Tricia Badillo. The classroom teacher is Juanelle Jenkins. She's a second grade teacher and has been in the district for 23 years, all at Blanton. And this was said about her. No matter what content she is teaching her second graders, Mrs. Jenkins masterfully engages them and leads them to deep levels of learning every day. She is also an expert encourager and builds up the confidence of students and staff. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next campus is Carrollton Elementary School. The, the principal is Monica Cohen. The teacher, the classroom teacher is Deborah Puente. She's a kindergarten teacher, and she has been with the district for 15 years. Deborah is always looking for new ways to help her students succeed, even when that means staying later during the week and coming in during weekends. She, as a colleague, she is caring, resourceful, and is always willing to help with instruction and learning experience of our students. Kids and parents both love her as well as colleagues. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Central Elementary School, and the principal is Luis Soto Dimas, and the classroom teacher is DeKendrick Williams who is a fifth grade English language arts teacher. You can clap. <laughs> and he's been with the district for two years. This was said about him. Mr. Williams is a great role model for all students. He determines what students needs and needs and does everything necessary to close the learning gap students have. He gives up any free time he has to provide support for all students and teachers. Congratulations. <laughs> Country Place Elementary School. <laughs> the principal is Kim Chow Jackson, and the teacher is Sarah Johnson. Ms. Johnson is a fourth grade teacher, and this is her second year in CFB. This was said about her. She is the epitome of a, of a phenomenal teacher. She establishes strong relationships with students and builds a strong sense of community in her classroom. She works with the fourth grade teachers to form the dream team. We are so blessed to have her. Congratulations. <laughs> Davis Elementary School. The principal is Lisa Williams. The teacher is Karen Ambrose music teacher. She's been 15 years in the district. 
uh, in, at Davis, and this was said about her. Her temperament and love of teaching music uh, permeates the classroom and the campus. Students say she is like their mom and listens like she really cares. We count on Karen to pray, laugh, and always see the silver lining in all things. She blesses us every day. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Freeman Elementary School. The principal is Robin Campbell, and the teacher is Jimmy Wang. Wong, I'm sorry, excuse me, Wong. And he is a, <laughs> he is a fourth grade math, science, social studies teacher who has been in the district five years. Jimmy is one of the kindest coworkers I have ever worked with. He is always willing to put in the extra time to do what is needed for students and his coworkers. Jimmy collaborates with team members, he listens, and is always ready to share great ideas. He's a lifelong learner, learner and a wonderful team member. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Furno Elementary School. Lori Parker is the principal. And the teacher is Jamie Banner. She's a first grade teacher, and she's been in the district five years. And this was said about her, Jamie puts her heart into everything she does at our campus. Jamie cares deeply about every student at Furno and develops strong relationships with students and families. We are blessed to have her. Congratulations. <laughs> Kent Elementary School. The principal is Debbie Williams, and the teacher is Myra Butler. She's a special education content mastery teacher and has been with the district four years. This was said about her. She began her journey of working with special needs students while attending R.L. Turner High School. At Kent, she services all grade levels and subjects as our content mastery teacher. Mrs. Butler's outstanding preparation, delivery, and care support the development of all our special needs students. She is a true team player and genuine in all she does. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Landry Elementary School. The principal is Stephanie Lopez. The teacher is Vicki Severs, and she's a kindergarten teacher. She has been with the district 15 years, and this was said about Vicki. She brings learning to life. She never passes up a teaching or learning moment with her children. She teaches her students how to be good people on top of the kindergarten curriculum. Everyone enjoys being around her. From her tone of voice to her positive attitude, she is an inspiration to us all. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Las Colinas Elementary School. The principal is Aviance Jones. <laughs> and the teacher is Jessica Knox. She's a third grade math and science teacher. <laughs> who has been with the district seven years. This was said about her. Jessica embodies the meaning of a team player. She will easily put the needs of others ahead of her own. She does so much for our campus, and I don't know if she realizes how valued she is. She always goes the extra mile to make sure that all kids are achieving their goals. We are Mustang strong with her on our team. Congratulations. <laughs> Lafayette Elementary. Is our next campus. Dream and Mayfield is the principal. The teacher is Jamie Shields. She's a third grade math and science teacher who has been with the district 50, 15 years. <laughs> Oops, 15 out of 15. She is a techie third grade teacher that has a classroom full of the latest technology gadgets, and her passion for technology is equally shared by her students. For the staff, Ms. Shields is a cheerful, friendly, approachable, go-to person for ideas and resources, or just plain assistance with a Chromebook, iPad, or rope, um, anything technology related. Students said that they are lucky to be in her classroom because she does at least one exciting thing, one exciting thing each day. We are so glad to have her in our, at our campus. Congratulations. Let's give all of our teachers as well as our students another round of applause.
That brings us to item 2C, district announcements. Dr. Chapman, CFP way. Yes, ma'am. First, we always showcase student artwork. And so in front of you tonight, you see uh, Creekview High School. So you'll, you'll be able to see some of the works when we go to break. Uh, take a look at all the wonderful things our students are doing in, in fine arts. Next, we would like to have Ms. Gillen, and she's going to present the Counselors Connection Center. Good evening, Dr. Chapman, Madam President, and esteemed board. Our Counseling Connection Center has been open for 10 weeks. The center serves our students and families ac across the district at no cost. This is a glimpse of some of our staff members who were present on a Tuesday night. As you can see, our rooms are warm, friendly, and inviting for our students and families. Counselors wear a blazer with our emblem and truly love the ability to practice their professionalism. The staff who serve our students are comprised of counselors from our school district, as well as counselors from the B Project and Safety Net that also serves our district. 19 families have completed 152 brief solution focused sessions. 24 families are currently being served. We have 55 families on our waiting list. Our staff uses counseling with toys with our youngest clients. Once a client has completed their sessions, they fill out a survey. Here are some of the responses to our survey. We felt very comfortable and my daughter was able to open up to the counselor. The receptionist was friendly and helpful. My phone call was returned within 24 hours and I felt comfortable speaking to her about my child's needs. My daughter and I have a much closer relationship and I will continue to work on it. Counselor was very friendly and gave options for us to work with helping to correct behavior. Thank you for offering this program to my family and I. Thank you for caring for our families. My son loved to come every Thursday to talk to the counselor. He loved it so much that he would remind me that we had counseling every Thursday. <laughs> Next steps. In the process, we are in the process of creating two more counseling offices and we're hiring four more counselors to serve our families on the waiting list. Dr. Chapman's vision for Counseling Connection Center is to serve many families. So as we continue to grow and shepherd clients, the future looks bright. Thank you. At this time, Ms. Parnell will uh, introduce Johnson's office. So, board members, tonight we have a special guest. If you'll go ahead and come forward, uh, Fawaz Anwar with Representative Julie Johnson's office is here and he has a special uh, announcement and presentation for you. Dr. Chapman, board members, um, I'm here on behalf of State Representative Julie Johnson. She cannot be here tonight. She has a prior commitment. And um, I'm just here to present a resolution from the Texas House of Representatives. Um, January was School Board Appreciation Month. I realize that this is March, but, you know, <laughs> things got kind of complicated at some point, so, <laughs> oh, I apologize. So, the resolution reads as, a resolution from the state of Texas, whereas school boards play an integral role in the education of our children and the observance of School Board Recognition Month in January 2020 provides a welcome opportunity to honor the trustees of the Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District and, whereas, Working in conjunction with administrators, classroom teachers, and parents, the board furthers the district's mission of providing students with the knowledge and skills necessary to become successful and productive citizens. Its responsibilities include setting policy and ensuring the efficient operation of school facilities with the goal of fostering an optimal learning environment for all students. And whereas the dedicated individuals presently serving on the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD board are President Nancy Klein, Vice President Guilmero Ramos, Secretary Tara Hrabacek, members Sari, Sally Derrick, John Matthews, and Randy Shackman, and of course the district also benefits from the able guidance of Do Superintendent Dr. John Chapman. 
and resolve that the Carrollton Farmers Branch and Penn School District to be, is to be commended for its service to the community and that its members extended the sincere best wishes for the continued success with their important work. You know, over the, over the course of the last few weeks, we've had a lot of conversations about the coronavirus and what's going on with, with what steps we're taking in CFB, how we're going to be communicating uh, a lot of the, the processes and procedures as this continuously unravels. And last night, a group of superintendents met with the CAC as well as TEA, and we keep continuously looking at how we can, how we can promote the safety and security of our students, the well-being of our students, and then process and procedures in the event that a situation occurs. And so at this time, I want Malcolm Maroney to kind of walk through what are we doing in the sake of cleaning? Because so many districts are also looking at hiring out companies, and we went above and beyond to take care of it in-house. And so, Mr. Maroney? Thank you very much, Dr. Chapman, for the opportunity to talk about our amazing custodial teams. Um, we had a year-long vision to roll out enhanced cleaning um, so that we would clean to a level that starts to impact attendance, uh, where we monitor, work with our nurses and monitor our asthma children and our allergies kiddos and really adjust our cleaning to serve that need. Um, this opportunity presented itself, so I went to the team and I said, you know that nine-month time schedule? Well, you got two weeks. Let's go. Um, <laughs> And if you know my team, they are incredible. They shone. Uh, Melvin Beckham came to the table with his years of expertise here at the district. Uh, Felix has just taken on every opportunity, uh, challenge that I've thrown at him. We have secured uh, 28 additional sanitizing uh, machines, which means that each campus will be assigned a hydrostatic uh, sanitizing machine and two at the high schools. Um, those will be branded and handed to the head custodians on Monday at their training. Um, we're going to use spring break to train everybody, get everybody up to sp uh, speed. What we've also done is simplified and enhanced our cleaning solutions. You'll be seeing green cleaning bottles coming out. Um, one darker green color for the uh, bathrooms, the rest is for everything else. These cleaning products find that sweet spot between getting rid of all the germs but not damaging our kiddos. Um, and that's the thing. There's some cleaning products that you can use but they ain't good for our kiddos. Um, so this really hits that, that sweet spot. Um, so we'll be rolling those out. Um, the other one is using different colored rags for different areas. We also secured 200 uh, hand, stand, hand sanitizer stations, um, which will be part of the head custodian training regiments and getting those filled and located in the right place. We don't need everybody coming in and touching door handles before we clean hands. Let's do that before we touch the doors. Um, so. I, whole, whole uh, regiment of items that we're going to be doing. Um, like I said, we'll be working with the head custodians on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. We'll be practicing on campuses. Wednesday will be test day. Make sure that we're up to stuff and ready for kids to come back on Monday. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Dana West, so if she would come up. She's our new Associate Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. We have, we spent a little over two months looking and searching for uh, an individual that would meet the needs of the district. And we went through two full interview processes with 11 and 12 people from elementary principals, secondary principals, directors, uh, people on the cabinet, then we went to the second level and she went, the first time she went, my gosh, this is a lot of people. I said, well, guess what? Get ready for the next round. And so the next round was even bigger. And so we had a very diverse group of individuals. And in the end, we unanimously picked Dr. Dana West as a new Associate Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction. Thank you. I, I am very humbled and excited with the opportunity to be here. And now I absolutely know that I'm in the right place. Uh, I, uh, faith and family are what brings me here and um, from the prayer that reminded us all to listen and learn uh, to the fact that um, in, in CFB we do nine months worth of work in two weeks. It sounds like, <laughs> sounds like I'm in the right place. So uh, really though I'm very excited. It was, it was so fun and refreshing to me to see the teachers come forward and for, for people to cheer and, and appreciate the work that educators do. I um, also cheer for and appreciate the work that educators do and I'm very 
again, humbled and honored to be here and to be able to have this opportunity to serve. So thank you so much for the opportunity. And Dr. West, would you just kind of give a, a little scenario of your, your background? You don't have to, please don't go all the way back, just in right. recent. Just recent past. So I was born, no, no. <laughs> uh, so, so I just, uh, in this last year, I've been the director of teaching and learning at Region 10. So I've been able to work with all the programs and processes and, um, and I'm excited about all the things that House Bill 3 has afforded us and the fact that I've been um, deep and heavy in that work. Before that, I was in the Amarillo Independent School District for 11 years, and I was a turnaround principal twice in that district, and an executive director, and also superintendent for three years. So uh, I, I really have, uh, I have a lot of experience and, and a lot of uh, ideas that I'm excited to share. Uh, but again, more importantly, I'm here to be at the table with all of you and to hear what your experiences are and to hear what, what we want to do together. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Update from our PTA, please. Good evening. My name is Heather Potts and I serve as the Reflections Chair for the CFB Council PTA. And Mr. Kellen Lewis, I think I've seen your name before. He's also excellent at art. <laughs> um, I'd like to update you as to the efforts of the Council PTO, PTA over the last few months. Um, I'd like to congratulate Rainwater Elementary, Carrollton Early Childhood, McCamey Elementary, Early College High School, Thompson Elementary, Newman Smith High School, Rosemead Elementary, and Polk Middle School for winning the Texas PTA Welcome Back Membership Award by submitting 10 new memberships in January. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Council PTA recognized our Reflections winners in January. Thank you to Newman Smith for hosting such a wonderful event. Um, 21 of those entries were sent on to Texas PTA. Texas PTA results are expected to be announced any day, technically March 15th, but sometimes they come back earlier. Please make sure to visit the Josie Ranch Library in Carrollton during spring break to check out the display of Reflections Award winners. All the art for um, the highest levels of awards will be there at the library for display. Uh, we're so proud of the artistic talents of our CFB students and thank all of those that participated. Some of you may have heard about the newest parent education initiative called Virtual Parent University. This unique learning opportunity features subject matter experts on camera. Because these information sessions are filmed, parents may access them anytime on the district's YouTube channel. Just look for the Virtual Parent University playlist. So far, we've had over 1,600 views. It's pretty good. We never had any, that many people come to an actual training. So <laughs> 1,600 people have actually viewed it. That's great. <laughs> I think it's a success. We'll keep doing it that, keep doing that, doing it that way. Uh, be on the lookout for more videos. Um, different topics will soon be released. So they're planning to do this as a continuing education, um, just building to the library. So those same topics will remain on the playlist and you can find others. In advance of the local elections in May, Council PTA and the AAUW will host a CFB School Board Candidate Forum on April 14th, right here in the boardroom. Doors will open at 6.30 p.m. and the forum will begin promptly at 7. Um, this is open to everyone and we hope the community will attend to hear from all of the School Board candidates. We invite everyone to join us for the upcoming Texas PTA Life Member and Membership Award Ceremony. It will be held on April 30th at 6.30 p.m. There is a new location this year. It is going to be hosted at Turner High School. No one could handle their stairs anymore at Perry. <laughs> um, we will honor all those receiving a Texas PTA Life Member Award, as well as hand out Texas PTA Membership Awards to our local PTAs. Everyone is invited and we hope to see you there. Our next council delegate meeting is on March 23rd at 6.30 p.m. in the ESD 
ESDC Texas Room, we invite everyone to attend. Remember to engage with your local PTAs on Facebook or other social media platforms to see more about the events and activities at all of our campuses to help meet our mutual goal of high achievement of each student. Thank you again for your continued support of PTA. Thank you, Ms. Potts and the PTA for all you do for our schools and our students. Um, thank you to the Lewis family. We love recognizing the kids in our district and their achievements, and we look forward to having more in the near future. Your kids are on the right track. Um, our teachers of the nine weeks, I think I need the last one. Was that um, Lavalita's technology help? <laughs> Um, but other than that, um, I'm thrilled and excited to hear about each one of your stories, and I thank your campuses for introducing y'all to us, and we look forward to meeting more as we go. And we do enjoy our end of the year banquet where we get to celebrate um, teachers again. So thank y'all all for teaching in our schools. And um, Mayor Die, I'm going to come up with a title for you other than Mayor Die. I'm taking nominations, but um, thank you for coming and helping and praying with us, and thank you for what you do for our community. So with that, it's only 7.31, by golly. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and we'll be back sometime before 7.45. The next item on the agenda is number three, audience for guests. Mrs. Kelly, are there any audience for guests this evening? Nobody wants to speak? Okay. Okay. There are no speakers for tonight's meeting. Item number four, consent agenda. The consent agenda is a mechanism that the board uses to approve a number of routine items together with a single vote. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the public notice for this meeting includes the list of all consent agenda items, and the board has been provided ample information about these items in advance. Prior to any action taken on the consent agenda, board members may request withdrawal of certain individual items for clarification or discussion board members are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda at this time miss herbacek thank you mrs klein i would like to pull item number f consider the approval of administrator contracts for individual consideration please so item 4f 4f are there any others mr shackman uh, i would like to pull item 4q the uh, Construction manager at risk for security vegetables item. So if there are no other items to be removed, do we have a motion on the consent agenda? Ms. Derrick, did you have a motion? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, got it. Okay, I move that we approve item four. Um, with the removal of F and Q. Thank you. We have a motion by Ms. Derry. We have a second by Mr. Ramos. Um, all those in favor? So that is six in favor and zero opposed. So Ms. Herbacek, would you like to talk about 4F? Are we doing that now? No, we'll do that. Oh, sorry. Oops. Me, I'm just trying to take care of business. Okay, item five. Non-action items for discussion and consideration. Five. 5A, Ms. Tillman. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this evening we wanted to provide you with a 2021 budget update, and we're going to start off with just some brief information about House Bill 3. So we are into March now, and unfortunately, TA is not moving that quickly and providing additional guidance um, to the district, even though we're supposed to be meeting spending requirements and doing all these things that we're still um, trying to determine the actual funding amount for. 
Um, PEMS is where we get a lot of our data um, in terms of our student ADA numbers, um, the different categories of students. These reports have not been updated yet to reflect many of the new categories that we'll be receiving weighted funding under, under House Bill 3, so we're still waiting on those updates. Also, many student information <laughs> systems have started working on versions of how to create these needed reports. However, TEA has not released where they're getting their numbers from, so all we can see is the end result. We can see some raw data, but they're not really sharing what reports they're looking at to get the, get the data, so we're still having a hard time um, getting those final estimates. And even with our comp ed and the complications of the census blocks and matching those census blocks to tiers, they keep rebalancing the tiers, and each tier has a different weight of funding, and so for us that's significant as they move a large numbers of students in between these tiers of funding. Um, they made two changes just in February on those, um, just that one item, trying to balance the students out into those categories. Um, and unfortunately, we can't wait on TEA. We've got to start working on our 2021 budget. And so with con continued uncertainty, it's going to start compounding as we are working into another year and we still don't know, you know, the accuracy of 1920. So we'll continue to work and make our best estimates on these items. This is just a reminder when we mention all the different categories. These are some of the new categories. Um, that we're receiving some weighted funding on. The dyslexia number is pretty easy to get. The comp ed is challenging. Bilingual, they've added new weights, additional weights on those um, in terms of two-way uh, dual language and one-way and English speakers in two-way. And so where they're gonna get all those numbers from, we're still trying to find out for sure. Um, career and technology education added two grades. Early education allotment. Um, that one's relatively easy for us to get, but we're, there's still some question on that as well. CCMR outcomes bonus is one of the big challenges. Um, right now, the numbers TEA has available are from 1617 results, and they're saying they're going to update that to 1718, and that's potentially what we're going to get funded for in 1920, but that could change as well. So we're still waiting to hear on that. Um, teacher incentive allotment, we're working towards a plan on that. And the mentor program, college prep assessment reimbursements, that one's also fairly clear. And then the certification exam re reimbursements. So these are all new elements to House Bill 3 that do impact our funding. Um, one of the items that we have also that we've mentioned is transition aid. And this is where the state looked to make sure under the new law you were receiving at least 103% of what you would have gotten under old law or 128% of the statewide average. And right now we are receiving those funds. Um, however, we had an unusual circumstance with the end of our TIF funds, and so TA has also not recognized that yet, and we've made multiple calls to try to make sure um, that they're handling it the same way our template's handling it. I know Dr. Chapman's talked to several folks as well. So we're hoping we can get that sorted out because that makes a big difference to CFB and it can shift some money in between either transition aid or lower our Chapter 41. It does have an impact on the district and so we're trying to get that resolved. So the tax rate is a big piece coming into fiscal year 2020. If you remember the way the state um, dealt with um, rising property values growth as they came up with a tax compression. And so tier one, um, which was the dollar worth of tax effort, got compressed the same amount for all districts last year. But beginning in 2020, everybody's tier one will be compressed differently depending on what your property value growth is. Um, so they've calculated a statewide average of 4%, and they've come up with what that compression would be. And then any district that has growth greater than 4% will be compressed an additional amount. So there's a state compression, and then there's local compression. And this is all on Tier 1, which is where they determine our share of Tier 1 funding. And so um, the theory is, is that compression's not supposed to have a negative impact on districts um, because as your tax rate gets compressed, then the state share of tier one will go up. 
Um, the challenge that's happening right now is that the state is saying that they're going to utilize values we get from the appraisal district in April to determine our, co our compressed rate. And the April rates are basically um, given to us and the appraisal district tells us we need to throw those in the trash because of the timelines, the data is just not valid. Um, so if that number is higher than what we actually will get certified on in July, then we're going to end up compressing our tax rate further down than what our final gain would be. So there's lots of discussion about that and how that's going to work out. So it may change as well, um, but that's down the road what's going to be happening with us. Um, in terms of what districts can do, um, districts um, have four pennies that are the golden pennies that they can take without voter approval. Beginning in 2020, districts can add an additional fifth penny. We already have these pennies, but this is just for your information. Um, so they could have five golden pennies. Um, the golden pennies went from six to eight. Um, and then you have your copper pennies that we also had that got compressed. Districts can go out to voters again to regain those copper pennies. Um, that's an option to gain some additional enrichment. However, the challenge with that is that if the state comes in and changes um, the yield on the copper pennies, they'll get compressed again, which would be very frustrating to voters if we keep having to go back and ask for pennies um, and then the state comes back and makes those changes. So that's one of the um, new challenges of the system as well, whereas in the past you only had to go to the voters once, now you could have to go multiple times depending on what the state decides to do. TEA strategic priorities, um, they have developed that recruit, support, and retain teachers and principals, build the foundation of reading and math, connect high school to career and college, and improve low-performing schools. And these were their strategic priorities, and you'll see funding aligning with this, and also uh, many of CFB's priorities also line right up with the state's strategic priorities. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Roderick. He's going to continue on with more specifics about our budget. Uh, yes. <clears throat> we just want to go over briefly the 2021 budget calendar and how, how those processes work with us. In January, we just wrapped up our 18-19, but now we're jumping all the way to 2021. And so during January, we try to finalize our budget priorities going into 2021. And then in February, around the 20th, uh, we send out our uh, non-personnel budgeting to our campuses and departments. Those are the things like electricity or just your regular supplies. And then and then by by the first week of March we try to communicate formless staff to our principals. And then in uh, April, by April 3rd, we want to try to finalize any new positions for that we've approved or uh, identified as priorities going into 2021. Uh, new this year is on May 1st, TA will open a data collection window for districts to submit property tax data uh, that it will determine your, like Tanya said, our tier one tax rate. Uh, th <clears throat> this is, like you said, we're at, on May 1st, this will be data from our April um, appraisal districts. And usually, like you said, it's a, it's a big difference than when what it is in April versus what it is at certified values in July. <clears throat> in, uh, in May, we will bring you back another budget update. And hopefully at, in, the, in the June 4th uh, uh, board meeting, we'll also bring back a, a compensation adjustment. Uh, for your consideration. In uh, July, uh, June and July of 2020, TEA will release those maximum tier one tax rates uh, for districts based on the data we submitted in May. <clears throat> so this will be the uh, uh, rates that we'll have to adopt in, um, in August. And June, uh, July 25th, we'll get our certified values from our appraisal districts. On August 6th, tentatively, we'll give you uh, one last budget update. Um, on August 10th, that will be where we will post our required budget um, meeting or public notice uh, in the newspaper uh, to discuss the tax rate in our budget, in our 2021 budget. And on August 20th, uh, we'll have, uh, we'll consider the tax rate in our 2021 budget. And like Tanya mentioned, uh, in May, we'll, like I said, we'll submit our, our data to TEA and that data will be based on our property value growth that we submitted during, during that time. And in the summer, uh, TA will release those uh, um, rates to us. And this is just an overview. And you can see in 18, 1819, this was pre House Bill 3, our tier one was $1, and we had our gold, golden pennies of, of six. And then you, got, you had access to another 11 copper pennies uh, with a total of $1.17. 
<clears throat> and then now as we move to uh, 1920, uh, part of House Bill 3, you can see Tier 1 was compressed to 93 cents, and we had available eight golden pennies, which are not subject to recapture. And then you see our copper pennies was, com were, was compressed from 11 cents down to 0.05835. And so for 1920, we have a general fund tax rate of 1.0635. And now we fast forward to 2021. And based on our, uh, we, we briefly had a uh, meeting with Dallas County. And, um, but right now, we're, we're assuming our 7% property value growth. Uh, and that's based by using that 7%, uh, that compresses our tier one tax rate to 0.8872. Uh, our golden pennies will say the same as well as our copper pennies. Th that's not compressed uh, in 2021 because of the yield, uh, the, the le Texas legislature has not changed y the yield on those pennies. Um, like I said, House Bill 3 also, you know, limits the districts to 2.5% growth. And so, you know, if we exceed that, then that's going to even compress that tier one tax rate even further. And just want to confirm that that tier one number will come from the state. We don't calculate that. They will calculate that for each school district. This is just an estimate on our behalf just to show you an example of what could happen with our tax rate. And then as we develop our budget forecast, these are kind of the assumptions we are taking. Uh, property value growth of 7%. Um, like I said, we met with uh, Dallas County Appraisal District last week, and they had said, when we met with them, they had said, well, you know, the, the property's still on fire, and it's going to be, and they're maybe even predicting that uh, the growth will be the same as last year. And so that was at 9.25. And so these could very well be updated as we get more information from our appraisal districts. Uh, later in the month, we'll meet with Denton and, and have that same discussion to see where they think our values will go uh, heading into uh, 2021. Uh, also, uh, we're projecting flat student growth from 1920, uh, from 1920 current estimates. Uh, also, a compensation adjustment under consideration is between 2 and 3%. This is very preliminary, but this is just gives us an idea to, to um, get some numbers in place. And as we look at uh, continuing on our budget forecast, uh, right now we're projecting uh, the net change from 1920 to a, from adopted budget to the current estimate in 2021 net of recapture. Uh, we believe we'll see about $3.7 million increase. Uh, this is largely due to uh, student enrollment decline less than what we anticipated. With the charter schools, with multiple charter schools opening up at the beginning of 1920 school year, we had <coughs> projected a, um, a, a student enrollment decline, and so that has been less than what we anticipated. So that's a positive, and so we're, we're kind of using uh, what our enrollment is as of the, the third and fourth six weeks to project out you know, for 2021. We're keeping that student enrollment flat going into 2021. And then spending requirements, we've, we included contingencies in the 1920 budget to meet those new state allotments, the increase in our early, early education allotment and the, and the changes to compensatory education. And so we'll, access, we'll, we'll have to access those funds to meet those priorities in those early literacy plans. Now, like Ms. Tillman said, the formula transition grant, so every presentation we'll probably bring to you and we'll always mention the formula transition grant just because, just to put it in the back of your mind. So right now, our current projected uh, formula transition grant is $19.2 million for uh, 2021. Our original budget in 1920 was $26.6 million, and that's just because of the positive variance in our students, where we, didn't ex where we, we, we expected more students, more student loss, but that hadn't really last so far. Uh, the formula transition grant also affects you know, state allotments included in Tier 1, and that includes like our teacher incentive allotment. Uh, and then uh, this also limits, limits future growth uh, until the district outgrows uh, the target revenue, target, target formula transition grant calculations. And this is very similar to the old, uh, uh, old target revenue models that we had under previous law. And then as we look at our budget priorities going into 1920, uh, we identified full day pre-K added at eight campuses. Uh, GT STEM Academy opening at Landry, uh, additional counselor support as well as additional instructional coach support, um, early, early literacy plan which will include some re reading academies and other identified needs, <coughs> and capital and technology needs. This is ab above that's not included in the uh, bond or uh, just the above current allocations and a compensation proposal. 
Um, as we evaluate whether that lands, uh, this will probably this will include stipends uh, for athletics and our fine arts. And as we look at our next steps going forward, uh, we'll, we'll continue to monitor TEA guidance to update our estimates, and we'll also have communications with uh, our appraisal districts uh, to make sure we get an accurate number that we submit whenever that uh, time frame opens. And we'll continue with the budget process and hope of finalizing staffing by April 3rd. And we'll, we'll finalize proposed compensations by the May or June board meeting. And we'll provide update estimates at the April and May board meetings as well. And that concludes my present, our presentation this evening. Thank you. I have a question. So what happens if property values ever decrease? Well, that? with the current uh, Current value model, uh, they say that that's supposed to correct itself. That way, you, you, you and before we were on a one year lag, and so with the current the going to current values, that would correct itself, you know, during settle up at the end whenever uh, all that is submitted to CEA. So it shouldn't harm us like before, where you would have the one year lag and you would have to uh, wait for that catch up. Board members, any questions? Mr. Shackman. Mr. Roderick, uh, the teacher incentive allotment on here, is that where we got the, what was it, $5,000 required? That was, a, it's a different place. What's the status of that continuing, do we know? And is that, how does that impact the budget in terms of, do we continue that $5,000 ad for teachers each year? Oh, yeah. Um, the um yeah that will continue that hasn't actually started yet we have a long planning process to go through for that um so there's there's not any funds coming in on that right now but, there, but there's two basic components there's one the pay raises which was part of that initial which is part of their base salary now right. and the teacher incentive allotment is that piece that depending on if they're master recognized yeah. exemplary whether you're rural or non-rural, and they can get anywhere from 3000 to 32000 annually. We still don't know the rules, but we're in cohort three, or C in this case. We're going to move forward with T-TESS and T-PESS so we can get on that evaluation, which will roll us into the 21-22 school year. All of those funds will come from the state. They're not going to be coming from local funds. And that's the part that we're concerned about because it's a part of Tier 1, yeah. and it's not it's not adding it to our uh, you know funds it's kind of shifting the pot from uh, you know from our trend formula transition funds down to uh, that teacher incentive allotment and that's where it's concerning and, and note that if a teacher is is labeled a master teacher that goes on their certification for five years so it's not like one year and then you get reevaluated it's a five year um, label as responsibility we're call it at this point but it could be up to thirty two thousand dollars per teacher a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I do have one. It's, I don't think it's budget related, only something that was in here. Um, on the budget calendar, the April 3rd, 2020, finalize, approve new positions. And when is our job fair? The 28th of all, uh, March. Okay, so how, I mean, I'm, well, we, you know, this, it, that job fair is to replace positions, I guess, that we know about that yeah, attrition we, we, or things, you know, or you already have an idea? Yes and no, we've already started the process, and, you know, again, some of that money's coming from early literacy allotments, some's from comp ed, we've already started the process of making some of those additional hires, because we've got to have a deadline date, but yeah. on March 28th, you know, yes, principals are already making determinations on, I have these openings right now, and let's start the process of filling those. I just want to make sure none of those great teachers out there get away from us. No, ma'am. We're, we're, we're getting them all. That's the... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Any other? I'm not aware of that. Mr. Matthews is asking where, where we'll... Thank you. Board members, any other questions about the budget? Looks like we don't have any more questions, Ms. Tillman and Mr. Roderick. So that takes us to item 5B, construction update. Mr. Mulroney.
Good evening, members of the board. Dr. Chapman, thank you for this opportunity to give you a quick construction update. Um, we've got a number of things going on. Landry Elementary is wrapping up its phase two portion, which was the internal classroom renovation, and it's really looking special. Um, Balfour Betty is going to be punch listing, finishing out test and balance, so there's still lots of work to do over the next month, but really the uh, the visibility, you can see the area, the kids are actually starting to move into some of the, the spaces. Um, we're also going to be working with our leadership team to develop what kind of furniture goes into the space now. So we'll be working with the, uh, the chiefs on that and as well as teachers to understand what to do with it. Is that the library? Uh, no, ma'am, that's the new collaboration space oh. mm -hmm. um, inside of the uh, classrooms. So that used to be four classrooms back to back in that area and they opened it up. Um, built the addition to accommodate for the lost classrooms and then created this collaboration space in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it, ribbon cutting was, you know, yeah. potential date, month, not yeah. date, don't give a date. <laughs> um, we'll be looking in that May, May window. Um, so a little preview, June of 2019 on the left and uh, February of 2020 um, on the right. A quick shout out to Miss May's um, reading class. They're not waiting for us to get furniture in there. <laughs> <laughs> the walls are down, the carpet's clean, the kids are moving. Um, and it is so rewarding to see them. You've got four, you know, different groups learning here. You've got three on the floor, two in the back there, one against the wall. Um, kind of just find a corner by himself there. Um, just doing what they need to be doing to get the work done. Everyone was engaged. The teacher was smiling. It was just a great morning over there. Another quick look at the small collaboration space. Another one to keep on, on your radar is that big gray wall at the entry is not done. Please don't go there and go, what? That, that's not our standard. Um, we are <laughs> going to be doing a, a graphics package against the wall, but with all the different academies and, and programs that we're offering, we want to make sure that we design it enough where we can adapt if change, programs change, but it's cohesive enough that it looks like a, a single campus. Uh, so that challenge we'll be taking on for the next uh, few months and will be done before ribbon cutting. Um, I hope. Multi-purpose knock building is also underway. Um, big challenges there have been really things that don't show. It's the getting the data drops, getting the phones, getting the uh, electric on, uh, getting all the systems finished. So not a lot has changed in the picture world, but a lot has changed in the building, building functionality. Um, here was meeting with our engineers. Uh, there's BJ in the new data room figuring out where all the different racks are going to go and all the details of which sequence the switches are going to be and how much space do they need and all the AC and everything just the way we need it for the CFB way. Uh, plus on the right is our new 700 kilowatt generator uh, to keep the knock alive if anything happens since that will, with all the information coming through the knock that is absolutely critical. Quick view on the outside, there's the ballrooms, they're coming along. Athletic projects kicked off and Hellas took our took our lead and got moving. Um, if you've seen out there, they are moving fast. So four fields again, just a quick recap of the projects, which the uh, four football fields at Turner, Smith, Creekview and Ranchview, and then Creekview and Ranchview baseball and softball fields. Um, here's some pictures, Ranchview football goals coming out, because the new package will bring new soccer goals, new football goals, new flags, uh, new pads, uh, as well as new long jump and uh, pole vault uh, pits and boxes for their, those guys. And then on the right, you can see where the old long jump used to be. In Smith, it was inside the field. So that will be relocated to an area outside of the, the track area. And this will be turf when we come back in June. 2018 bond update. We are moving and the team's doing great. Um, just a quick recap of the overall package. There are three phases or series to the bond. So couple of different terminologies out there, but really it's three packages. The first one, which we're in design with and going to be bringing GMPs forward tonight and well is in May. The second, we've just kicked off with our architects. And then the third is planned out in 2022. Here's a quick schematic of how that lays out. So diving into the series one projects, um, everything's tracking for a summer start. That will be all four sites going under construction. As we said, Sheffield will still be in design phase, so we'll do more demo work over the summer, and the, the new building construction will be happening in October. Um, but all four sites will be under construction. McCorder, we'll hear about more this evening. New Sheffield, we've met with the city of Dallas. Um, we've got all our zoning stuff figured out. We've got our path. Met with our council uh, woman over there in Dallas, who is very helpful um, and engaged. Uh, great supporter of the schools, and that's going to be a massive help to us, um, as well as 
getting all the design stuff finished with LPA. Vivian Field, this would be, you start to see those collaboration spaces that you saw at Landry, that idea starts to come back. This would be a space in between the classrooms where it allows that collaboration uh, learning to start to happen. And again, we're working on getting all our permits pulled for that and a GMP to come to the board in May. Turner follows the same schedule as May, uh, Field and will be a GMP in May as well for a construction start as soon as the building is available. Series two projects have started. We've done walks and initial meetings with uh, Newman Smith and Perry. Uh, we started laying out plans for the elementary schools. That would be six elementaries and then Sandridge Stadium um, is still scheduled to be walked by our architects. Here's a quick look at the construction uh, schedule. We'll spend the year designing, understanding what we need to do, start our construction in May, and that will run two years of construction through to August of 2022. That's what we got. Board members, any questions for Mr. Moroni? All right. Thank you. So, item six, items for discussion and or action. Um, we had two items removed from the consent agenda, so now we're ready for 6A. Uh, Ms. Herbacek, 4F. Um, yes, just there were some individual considerations on this and um, some from a couple board members. So I move that we approve the administrator contact, contracts as presented but excluding Vivian Field Middle School, Newman Smith High School, and Ranch View High School. So I think we did that already. No. Okay. okay. So, Ms. Derry, so we have a second, and um, all those in favor or any discussion first, or we're ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor? So that's six in favor and none opposed. Next. Uh, I move that we approve the administrator um, contracts for uh, Vivian Field Middle School and Newman Smith High School. So we have a motion. We have a second by Mr. Shackman. All those in favor? So we have. I'm going to abstain on that one. Five in favor and one abstention by Mr. Ramos. So, Ms. Derek? Mr. Ramos? I'm going to we approve the uh, administrator contracts for uh, Ranch View High School. We have a motion for that. We have a second by Mr. Matthews. All those in favor? So we have five in favor and and Ms. Herbacek is abstaining. So now we're on 4Q. Mr. Shackman. Ms. Klein, uh, we discussed in our uh, pre-meeting review that we want to add uh, the names of the high schools involved on item 4Q. Uh, it is a, a project that we have as a district undertaken security upgrades at every one of our campuses. Uh, this particular um, summary is dealing with the construction manager risk approvals for uh, three high schools and in the process of preparing it we simply uh, called it three high schools and we want the public to be aware that it is Smith, Creekview and uh, Ranch View that are the three high schools here. If there is any question from parents or whoever, uh, the bond package, in fact our meeting just discussed Turner High School, those processes and uh, the same kind of security vestibules are happening there. So hence, there are just the three here. But just so that it would be clear for everyone, uh, whether you're watching this on video later, and uh, if we could make sure when this gets into the minutes for us to approve, that we will have added the names of the three high schools to this particular piece for Q. And uh, with that in mind, I would make a motion that we accept as presented with the addition of the three high school names, item 4Q. So we have a motion by Mr. Shackman. Did he make a motion? Yes. And a second by Mr. Matthews. So um, any further discussion? If not, all those in favor? 
but six in favor and all unanimous. So that brings us to item 6B, consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price for McWhorter Elementary School. Mr. Mulroney. Good evening, members of the board. Dr. Chapman, thank you for the uh, opportunity to present more quarter project. However, uh, Bobby Shaw um, is our project manager on this, and so he's going to take the opportunity to, uh, to walk you through a bit of the scope of the project and present that guaranteed maximum price. <clears throat> Dr. Chapman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, I appreciate this opportunity to bring the uh, McCorder GMP before you. Uh, given that this was one of the first projects out of the bond, we wanted to make sure that uh, we met the most value for the district, got the, the most value for our dollar, and met what the BAC set out to us for to do. <clears throat> we did want to be sure that we incorporated every recommendation. Uh, bringing on LPA early on with Jackson Construction, we were able to hash through some of those conversations uh, and come back with a solid GMP of uh, $3.9 million. That originally started with 4.2 based on what the BAC recommended, recommended uh, but we pulled that out with our HVAC purchase. We were able to pull about $300,000 out of that as uh, you guys approved a few uh, weeks ago. Um, oh, sorry. Some of the big budget items we did hash out were uh, we knew it would be in building systems, so a new roofing system, HVAC installation, uh, upgraded fire alarm systems, new LED lights in the gym, as well as uh, new plumbing fixtures. Uh, we wanted to be able to sure that we were able to uh, really understand what was going on in McCorder, so we met several times with uh, Eddie, the principal, some of her staff members, and even students along the way. Um, not just to see what they needed, but what they're trying to achieve in McCorder and what else we could achieve uh, for CFB. Um, so like I said, some of the areas we are covering are heavy in uh, MEP, um, also technology and security, so we're adding uh, additional cameras, upgrading our Wi-Fi system, additional access points, uh, door locks, and some safety ballers at the entryways. As we move into the interiors, we wanted to keep a mindset and our efforts focused on what exactly we wanted to achieve. So most of the efforts are going to be put in the main corridor and high profile areas. Uh, given that this is a 20-year-old building, it, uh, it looked dated and we needed to upgrade it and update some of our items. Um, so we'll be adding some resilient foreign throughout the uh, entryways, throughout the main corridor, uh, wrap around into the cafeteria, some plastic uh, wains coating along the way to protect some of our uh, highly valuable areas as well. Uh, we felt that some of this uh, updated in color would give it that pop. And that updated look that McCorder sorely needs. Uh, we're also adding some carpet in the main office, stage areas, and paint throughout the, those areas as well. Being that this is an AVID school, we wanted to integrate those uh, concepts that AVID um, <coughs> excuse me, pushes out, leadership, inspiration, collaboration. Um, we really wanted to incorporate that into the learning environment. And the best way to do that was hit that in the uh, library makerspace area. So we're uh, tearing out an old uh, computer lab and expanding that area to uh, become a part of the building. You know, uh, students can create projects. They can uh, use the writable wall surfaces. There's prep areas uh, with wet sinks. Um, new green screen room where they can uh, make videos that they can show to their friends uh, and display that stuff. I'll go back through the, uh, if you look there past the Maker's Den wall, there is a two-way display board that'll go to the cafeteria. There's one on the left side that'll go out to the hallway so they can show off their projects that they've made uh, in that area. We're also adding a green screen room so they can make videos and we'll have interactive boards throughout the campus that they can uh, present that on as well as smaller collaborative booths. Um, in an effort to bring that environment, what we're doing inside out, we are going to update the uh, painting on the canopy, uh, improving the landscape with new waste receptacles, updated LED lights in the parking lot, as well as installing these uh, stone bollards throughout. If you look on the bottom right of the picture there, um, so not just safety and security aspect, but also uh, a visual aspect for the campus, create a, a coyote canyon, if you will, complete with a uh, coyote silhouette that the, picture, the kids can come and take that first day photo. Uh, staff can come take photos around. Um, so we are really excited to bring uh, McCorder to you and uh, 
we'll be starting here at the end of the school year and should be wrapping up before the staff comes back in August. Thank you all. So board members, we had that presentation. Are there any questions about the presentation or action that you want to take? Do we need the number? <clears throat> it says as presented. Uh, I move uh, that we approve the guaranteed maximum price, the GMP, for McWhorter Elementary School as presented. We have a motion by Mr. Bacek. We have a second by Mr. Shackman. Is there any discussion? Just a comment. I like the display wall idea. So, in, so that'll go to the hallway and to the cafeteria. That's really, that's really cool. I like that. Like that. And I would point out that the bollards look like they might be good to sit on also, <laughs> where normal bollards, not so much. Not so so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> friendly bollards. Yeah. So, um, and, and they provide safety and security also. That's impressive. It's, it'll be a great change. And I appreciated having our work study there back in the <laughs> fall. That was helpful to get the preview of all this prior to this also. Um, so, board members, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor? So that is six in favor and zero opposed. So thank you, Mr. Moroni and Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, so that brings us, Dr. Chapman, to comments number seven from board members regarding posted agenda items. Board members, do you have any comments you wish to make at this time? By golly, our audience is going to be so disappointed. It's a, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our agenda at 8.26 p.m. and we are adjourned. <laughs>